question. So please feel free to jump in wherever ever you feel the need to. Um, is that both Allie and I um, have young kids at home. I have three daughters, uh, 10, 11, and two. Um, and then Allie's got two, two children at home as well. Um, and so part of given our current landscape and, and life really is that we're all trying to do these things in a different way that we did eight, 10, 12 months ago. Um, and that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is, is from a time management, from a budget perspective, um, and just from a life management perspective and how we can kind of find efficiencies in trying to drive our digital, um, our digital landscapes while managing the rest of life too. And, and Ali can uh, talk specifically about, about how, how much that time management piece comes into play play here. Um, just from your perspective, Ali, um, um, when you're when you were looking at this from a time management perspective, um, how does that impact your life? Um, I find I have a staggered day. Um, you know, getting up early before the kids get up, then do some work, then I take a break. I know you do the same errand to get kids fed, <laughs> dressed, and either on their virtual school or out the door to public school. And then I'm making sure we, you know, we take our breaks during the day too to get away from the screen because um, it's very strange not being together working as a team. And with the time management, um, we'll talk about it later on in the presentation uh, about managing social media and how important it is to create a schedule for yourself so that you don't miss anything and give yourselves timelines. Awesome. Yeah. So that's, that's a lot of the pieces that we want to bring today is, and any, when we're talking about any of this, we want to make sure we're, we're coming at it from a realistic and efficient uh, perspective. And, and a lot of that with a lot of what, with any kind of digital ecosystem um, is it's about being selective about where you put your efforts, where you put your opportunities or find your opportunities um, and how you push all of those things forward. So starting kind of at the basis, what is a digital ecosystem? Uh, when we talk about a digital ecosystem, we, we're talking about anything that exists online, right? Um, so we could be talking about a website, we could be talking about your social, we could be talking about developing mailing lists, um, and really it's how all of those things work together. Um, every piece from a, from, from a digital perspective does not live in a silo. Um, it's connected to something and someone and somehow, right? So we want to create, um, what we're always trying to do with, with an, digi any of your digital ecosystem is create a linear experience. And what I mean by that is from a first touch point, so whether that's through a social post, whether it's through a Google ad, um, whatever that is, um, creating consistency in your messaging and your creative um, and really trying to push push your users to an endpoint where you can capture them in a conversation or in a sale um, and really create elevation for your brand. So that's what we're going to really be focusing and looking at today. Um, the one the one big piece that I, I want everybody to kind of take away from this is that um, activating means action. So with with digital. Um, anything they're doing, anything, um, anything time that you're, you're pushing your button or you're expecting somebody else to push a button, there's an action and then there's a reason behind it. Um, and then we're going to go over what, what that looks like today and how you create that uh, linear experience for people. So the first thing you need to do is a plan. Um, so just like with anything from marketing and, and, and the, your digital ecosystem is just an extension of your marketing. It's just a different piece of it. Um, anything that you're doing needs to have a plan behind it. Um, the, the, the biggest, uh, from an agency perspective, the one thing that we see is um, people want to get on social and, and they want to start developing this digital footprint, um, but they don't really have anything they're driving towards. They start posting kind of randomly and hoping for the best. And, you know, sometimes that, that can bring up a lead here and there. It can get a, a sale here and there, but um, anything that's purpose driven is going to have a strong outcome on the other end. Um, and so it's really important that you start to evaluate what your plan is. So what are, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Um, have you given thought and to what your end goals are here. Of course, you want to be online, you want to be present, but what do you want that presence to turn into? Do you want it to turn into sales? Um, does your business model mean that you need to get people off digital and into like a physical space or a conversation? Um, there's all kinds of outcomes that, that could be um, specific to your needs, um, but it's important that you evaluate from your own perspective what it is that you're trying to accomplish and you work backwards. So again, some of those purposes could be elevating your brand. Um, you know, if, if you're just getting started and you, you want, uh, you're, it's just, you want to be known. Um, do you want to create uh, conversations? Um, in a lot of cases, you want to generate new sales one way or another. Uh, so, but how does that look from a digital perspective? And more so than anything else, whether it's elevating your brand, creating conversations, creating sales, you want to generate these relationships that are going to extend beyond this first touch from a digital perspective. Um, and, and there's lots of opportunity to curate those relationships in digital environment. 
and again, just to, to, to reiterate, um, knowing what your end game is, is here is really going to make a difference uh, for you. Um, it's really going to guide any of your choices that you make. So if, if you know from the outcome that you're trying to create new sales, well, that's going to drive and permeate everything that you do. And it, it should permeate everything that you do um, from a digital perspective as you're kind of laying out this ecosystem that you're trying to put together. So knowing what you want to accomplish before you get there um, is a key takeaway. So where do you start with this? Okay, so you've kind of put a plan together. You have an idea of what you'd like to accomplish. Um, but again, a lot of time when, particularly for people who are just kind of getting going from a digital perspective, um, you're just kind of putting out there and saying, well, the whole world is an audience. Well, we, know, we all know that's not the case, right? Uh, it's, it's important that you kind of do the work up front to identify who your audience is. Um, and so that's, that's talking about, um, you know, who, who from a, um, uh, is it a male, female? Like what demographic are they living in? Um, where, where do they exist both online and in person? Uh, what kind of things that, what kind of habits do they have online? What kind of habits do they have offline? Um, really identifying those kind of target personas are, are really important as a first step. And so that leads into who are you talking to? And so if you have an idea of who you're talking to and who you want to be speaking to, um, this will kind of run through all everything that you're putting together as well. So whether that's from the messaging and how you're talking to somebody uh, or the creative that you're going to use to try to uh, capture attention uh, or the landing spots that we're going to get to a little bit later about um, if you're pushing them to a website or if you're pushing to them to a call to action, um, how do you form it? How do you form the, that, that language and how do you form that creative that'll appeal to a certain audience? And so it's really important that you take the time up front uh, before you kind of start taking that online action to identify who it is who it is that you want to talk to um, and where they are um, and so when I when I, I mentioned about where they are it's in real time and online so are they living on social are you going to get them through Google Google searches um, are you know if you're getting uh, from an agricultural perspective do you need to be speaking to people super early in the day um, or from a, you know if you're trying to talk to um, somebody who's online um, all, all times of the day do you need to be posting later at night so it's really important to do that kind of evaluation um, and have an idea again of, of who your audience is um, um, what their interests are what kind of demographics we're talking about and then where they're living online Uh, and so we, from that, we move into a conversation around content. And so when we talk about content, we're talking about anything that we're posting. So from, a, um, from an example, if, if it's uh, an image you're putting up or if it's a messaging you're putting up, maybe it's a blog you're putting up to generate interest. Um, in, in this scenario, when we're talking from a uh, business owner perspective and particularly from a small business owner perspective, like we have in our, in our crowd today, um, we need to be really con have a huge consideration around time. Um, because there's, there's really two ways to do this. From a budgetary perspective, we can invest in social, we can invest in developing our digital landscape. And usually that takes um, some assistance from an agency like ClearVision or, or anybody else maybe that you have in-house um, to develop all of these kind of things. Um, but let's be honest, not everybody has that time. And that's a lot of why we're here today. Uh, and so the biggest piece that I can take away from a content perspective, and we're gonna drill down on this a little bit, um, is that you don't need to create everything from scratch. You can curate based on the existing things that you have already. So look at what you have already. What elements exist that are kind of in your, uh, your marketing realm all, uh, already? Um, there's a big, from, from an agency perspective at ClearVision, we've seen a real um, shift in, in terms of what the expectation is online. Um, and, and a lot of, uh, at one point in time, everybody was really, really looking for something really slick and professionally put together. And of course, we want to be able to do that. Um, but from being realistic, we don't always have the time and we don't always have the budget to be able to invest in things like that. Um, so the fact that we can get something up and get it up quickly, um, it provides opportunities to start creating those relationships. And that we don't maybe don't have the same expectations around what it means to have um, this really carefully, slickly curated uh, presence that we might have 12 months ago, right? It's, it's really shift and, and there's a, a different perspective on, on what that means right now. And I think there's, there's a real opportunity uh, for small businesses to be able to take advantage of that. Um, so really looking at what you have already. Um, so what kind of existing stock photography uh, and imagery do you have on hand? Uh, what time of brand creative? Uh, what, is, what exists already? What kind of uh, effort have you put into from a marketing perspective previously that you could bring and use? Um, what talent do you have? Um, 
you know, when we talk about personalities, everybody likes to connect with the personality from a human touch. And I think that's a really important element to take as well. Um, if you have people that you can lean on uh, to be in front of your camera, whether that's you or somebody else, that, that can be really important. Um, everybody has a phone in their pocket at this point, which provides lots of opportunity uh, for capturing uh, in, the moment converse, uh, in the moment content, um, behind the scenes content, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so Allison runs a lot of uh, our campaigns uh, through ClearVision. Um, Ali, do you want to maybe just touch on the different types of uh, content you see from our, from our clients and, and what they're kind of putting out there? Yeah, so we work with a wide variety of, of clients um, from small business to enterprise, uh, from the food industry, uh, beverage industry, um, and products. So what we see is kind of if they have a contest that they want to run they to get more eyes onto their social media and onto their online store sometimes it's content about the struggles they're going through right now and they're being real online uh, sharing news um, sharing success stories uh, and really thinking a lot of small businesses are really thinking about local right and how can they um, integrate into their local community. So a lot of, like I said, success stories and local promotions and things like that um, online right now. Yeah, right on. Thank you. And so what Ali's... Uh... Oh, sorry, I'm just having a uh, technical moment here. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I, um, uh, full transparency, the, the power of my house keeps flashing and I was afraid that I've just lost all of you, but I've got my phone back up uh, here ready to go just in case. Perfect. Um, so what Allison was uh, touching on there was um, really talking about the human element of storytelling, right? And so when we're talking about even from contesting, are we talking about struggles or we're talking about um, any, any of those kind of look behind the curtain things um, is really focusing in on the messaging of, of the story that you're trying to tell. So again, relating back to the kind of pieces that we've touched on already, when you're putting your plan together, um, you're looking at your audience um, and then you're talking about putting together the types of creative um, to be able to tell your story. It's all going to come back to um, keeping that linear experience from uh, and setting expectations around um, the kind of storytelling that you're doing. Um, and from the first touch point all the way through until you want to capture, um, whether it's a lead or a sale, um, your messaging needs to be consistent and you need to be talking about, you know, giving, giving that human element and keeping your, your messaging um, really focused on um, the who and the what, um, and then bringing in the combination for, from your sales aspect as well, right? So um, finding that good balance, but really keeping a, a, a really good, a clean eye on what it is that you want to talk about um, and being consistent when you're talking about it. And so that brings us to um, really we've, we've, we're identifying our audience. Um, we have a plan together. Um, we're, we've, we've kind of curated our creative. We have an idea of what we can use to get our message out there. We've, we've spent some time thinking about how we want to talk about it. Now we have to pick a channel. Um, and so we're going to just take a quick cruise through here. Some of the existing channels that um, are the most popular right now. Um, talk about uh, the benefits and some of the uh, uh, some of the maybe not so great things about some of these channels. Um, but really, it's it, as part of your planning. It's important to identify channels that are going to work for you and again where your audience are living um, so if you have an older demographic um, the first thing you're going to do is want to go on Facebook so um, I mean Facebook is, is the most established um, of all the popular channels for the most part um, it's definitely skewing a little bit older these days but provides a, a really good opportunity from a sales in, environment um, Ali can you speak to your experience I know you're, you're doing a lot of uh, pushing a lot of stuff through Facebook these days um, can you talk about kind of who you're seeing is living on Facebook and the advantages of selling there yeah, I see um, everybody has Facebook. Um, as Aaron was saying, um, teens, young adults aren't on Facebook as much as some of the other platforms, but it is a huge platform where we get eyeballs on the topics, on the content that we're putting out. Uh, one thing with Facebook, and I'm sure everybody can attest to that, is there gets to be a lot of um, dialogue happening and when you are on Facebook you have to make sure you carve out the time that uh, you're going to be moderating um, you want to make sure that you're going to be involved with 
um, commenting back, moderating in case there's negative comments um, or inappropriate comments. And you'll find there's going to be a lot of, um, I find Facebook is one of the biggest ones where there's going to be a lot of action and traction with your social posts. So I find when I'm um, doing community management on Facebook, I make sure I have select times throughout the day where I check in to monitor posts for um, ClearVision and also for our clients. I kind of carve out time, morning, lunchtime, afternoon. And again, I check in in the evening before I go to bed on everything and just make sure there's no lingering comments, no messages, no requests um, out there because that's where you're going to find the most um, traction. Awesome. So the big, one of the big takeaways that, that Ali mentioned there is um, beyond just posting on Facebook. So it's one thing to be able to just post and let the post go and see what happens. Um, but there's a, there's a time requirement um, for what we call community management. And that's going in to, just to what Ali said about um, making sure you're responding to everybody who in, in engaging with your posts. Um, to making sure you're monitoring there's not any crazy stuff that uh, people are coming in and saying because um, the one thing you do have to be careful with is that with such a highly populated channel um, there's all kinds of opportunity for uh, conversations to go all over the place um, and, and in a lot of cases that's 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 what you want it's really it's a really good sign to see people engaging in your posts and in creating conversation but it can also to be careful from a management perspective that you don't let things go off the rail and you don't become known for having these kind of crazy comment sections and, and whatever else. So um, being, taking the time beyond just the post to be able to uh, manage the posts and manage the comments and manage the engagement is a huge uh, piece of being able to uh, really get the most out of Facebook and, and, and be able to elevate and or create your sales or whatever it is. But it, it's, uh, it's definitely more than just a post and, and kind of hoping for the best. Uh, and, that, and that takes us over to Instagram, which again, is, is, um, as we all know, is super popular as well. Um, a bit of a different selling environment in that it's highly visual, um, doesn't have quite the same level of engagement from a community management perspective. There's, all, there's still the comment section, but um, it's, not, uh, it's not quite as known for um, uh, the need to, to manage the community quite as much as, as with Facebook but still provides, uh, again, a really solid selling environment. Um, one thing that Instagram does better than anybody is Instagram stories, which you may or may not be familiar with, but that provides another unique selling environment um, that Facebook doesn't, that's, that's Facebook has, but it doesn't, they don't do it nearly as well. Um, it, the, we moderate from an age demographic, it skews a little bit younger. Um, if you're trying to look, if you're looking from a product perspective, and particularly if you have a young demo under 25, something like that, um, you're going to get a lot of success uh, kind of curating that channel as well. Um, but again, the, uh, take, uh, the takeaway from this is that um, really understanding your audience is going to dictate where you're going to spend your time um, from whether that's Facebook, Instagram, uh, or as we'll, we'll move through these, a few of the other platforms as well. Um, but really under, having an understanding of, of where your audience is, is existing and how they're existing on these channels uh, is going to be a, 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 big, a big thing that you're going to want to get out in front of um, just to make sure you're not wasting any time. Um, because a big, a big thing about this is you want to be really efficient with where you're using your time and being able to, uh, being able to develop those channels and get the most out of them um, is really important. So as we move uh, through Facebook, through Instagram, um, the, the most recent uh, social to blow up is TikTok. Um, now, from a TikTok perspective, is skewing super young. Um, the one thing that's required from TikTok is to develop a personality. Um, and so it's really personality driven. Um, it doesn't provide quite the sales environment as you get from Facebook and Instagram uh, and some of the other channels. Um, but so, so from a business perspective, um, that doesn't quite provide quite the same opportunity. Um, if you're going to go down this route and develop a TikTok channel, um, you're going to have to be very creative. You're going to have to uh, really have the time to, to put into developing yourself as a personality. And you're going to have to have a comfort level with that. Um, if this is something that you want to dive into, I'd be happy to chat through it with you. Um, but it's certainly not going to be um, one of the higher end recommendations um, in, before things like Facebook, Instagram, uh, and even LinkedIn, which we'll move into now. Um, so a lot of people uh, from a business perspective are using LinkedIn. It's really good lead generator um, from a personal brand perspective. Um, maybe not so much uh, in terms of a, a direct sale, like a sale, but certainly a good way to develop a personal brand uh, and to get messaging out there. 
Um, what do you, Allison, what do you find uh, from a client perspective about, uh, say, using LinkedIn versus uh, Instagram or Facebook? So um, I find with LinkedIn, it's a lot less moderating required. Um, and in this time over the last seven months um, with, with COVID, there's not the networking that's happening in person that used to be happening, you know, after after work, people getting together with clients, same with meeting new people and networking events. A lot of that's happening on LinkedIn. So as Aaron mentioned, LinkedIn is a great way for creating your personal brand. I find there's a lot of um, kind of networking, connecting happening in that way. Um, it's a lot more professional too. So like I was saying with less moderating required um, with social posts being done, uh, it's more like recognition, um, very professional comments because um, it's professionals that have their LinkedIn accounts, right? So it's a little bit different. Um, LinkedIn is key for business, I think, uh, from that perspective. And like Aaron mentioned at the beginning, when you choose to do social, pick what platforms you want, make sure you stick with it so that you um, stay relevant, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and so beyond the, the channels that we've mentioned, there's all kinds of other things, Twitter, YouTube, and there's going to be something else new that comes tomorrow. So uh, the one thing that I want you to take away from, from this is um, through, through your planning, um, through identifying kind of what your plan is, what your end game is, who your audience is and where they live, um, they'll dictate where you want to spend your time. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in, uh, flashing lights, so to speak. Um, there's all kinds of new stuff on the internet every single day. And really there's, um, it's very easy to get caught up in that kind of buzz. Um, but from a small business perspective, um, I just really want to reinforce the, the fact that you really want to be careful about where you spend your time um, and then commit to where you're spending your time. Um, if you are going to develop your Facebook and Instagram as your key uh, sales channels and as your conversation starters, then commit to those and stick with those. Um, it's, it's going to only hurt you to try to flip flop and keep up with every single social channel. Um, allow the social channels to establish themselves um, before you jump on and really look at it as trying to drive revenue. Uh, I think one thing that can, can be very dangerous from, from a small business perspective, again, if, if you're in the tech world, um, it's another thing, but if, if you're say you're running a clothing store or, or whatever else it is, um, that isn't necessarily just tech related, it's, it's very, uh, it makes a lot more sense to let the channels uh, establish themselves than try to be an early adopter, uh, and create early revenue. Um, really let those things develop and then, and then do an evaluation as to where, what makes sense and, and, and be smart about your time that way. Yeah. I just see in the comments, um, Jackie brought up that she's a LinkedIn profile, but uh, never uses it. Um, it's an interesting platform to use. Um, if you take a look at uh, your community on LinkedIn, uh, it's a great education platform too, where, you know, let's just say you're into massage therapy or you're into acupuncture or whatever, you are able to share a lot of knowledge um, to, to build your, your following and your community on LinkedIn. Perfect. Thanks, Ali. Um, so moving, moving, continuing on with the, with the social channels. Um, what, one of the things when we're talking about efficiencies and creating efficiencies is, um, is, about when and how you post and what you post. Um, try to do that on the fly. Uh, not only is is very challenging, but um, and, and from a, a time management perspective, um, I mean, think about any any given day that you have at any time. Um, you're probably doing, particularly if you're a small business owner, uh, you're probably doing nine thousand things uh, throughout the day, and trying to remember to post uh, a, a certain post with a certain message that's consistent with your overall plan can be a very challenging thing to try to come up with every single day. Um, but if you carve out a couple of hours and you pre-program everything, which with the the channels that we're talking about today and you have the ability to do that. Um, it can be such a huge time saver, uh, a management from a management perspective, it makes so much sense as you're able to kind of lay out your spread of posts for the next couple of weeks or even for a month um, and get an idea of what they all work, how they all work together. Um, and there's lots of opportunity to be able to do that through, um, through uh, 
uh, programming options like Sprout Social, like HubSpot, like Hootsuite that we've got here. Um, and Allison spends a lot of time doing this. So why don't I throw it over to you, Ali, and you can kind of give a rundown on what that means to you. Sure, thanks, Aaron. So um, basically when Aaron and I are carving out content uh, social content strategies for our clients and for ourselves, we build a calendar and we use like a Google Doc or, uh, you know, a Google form. And we create this content doc. Uh, we put in the dates, we put in the times we'd like to have something to go up because we schedule it in advance. Um, like Aaron said, helping run the business, working for our clients, having a family. I coach horseback on the side I'm really busy so being able to schedule things work best so with this content calendar you know we have November written in advance um, and we use a program called Sprout Social uh, for ourselves and for our clients and what that does is it lets us and our clients be able to see the content see the creative make comments of tweaks and changes that we want done um, and that we know with sometimes with clients, they've got multiple things going on in a day, they might be posting several times. So this post will go up at 9 a.m., this one's going at 11, this one's going at 5 p.m. after an announcement. Um, so Aaron's just moved the slide over here. Uh, let's look on this slide with what it looks like when you go to write a post um, in Sprout Social. So we have at ClearVision, we actively use Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. I've kind of gotten away from Twitter. It's just too much to keep up with. And um, what I can do is I write my content in. You can see where it says when to post. I can sp specific days and times. I could do a month in advance. I can advance the day before. I choose the date. I can add in my video or um, photo content or graphic imagery. And on the right hand side there, it says network preview. I'm able to see what it looks like both on a computer and on um, a mobile device. And the cool thing too is with some of the platforms like Instagram, you have to have your imagery be certain sizes. And you can edit that within Sprout Social as well. So it makes things really easy. Um, if there's ever an issue, you'll see in the top corner, there's like a little um, warning icon that also flags if, you know, an API needs to be renewed, refreshed, you know, LinkedIn needs to be refreshed frequently to avoid hacking. Um, so if something doesn't post, you go and see the alert and, um, and be able to fix it. So Sprout, I think out of, I haven't really used anything else other than I've tried Hootsuite and another one about six months ago with a client that just was not working well. Sprout is super user friendly. Um, I'm really happy with it. Yeah, the other thing that it allows to do is if you're working with, um, if you have a group of people that you're working with, is that you can you can pre-populate all of your posts and save them as drafts, so you can have somebody go in and check them and, and put a couple of eyes on them as well, um, which is always a nice safety feature, but uh, particularly the way Allison has described, um, when we put together a content calendar through a Google Sheet or Excel Sheet, um, and then we're able to uh, to have a look at our spread and then move it from the Excel Sheet into the into these posts, um, it works pretty seamlessly. Um, and it's it's really key for organization. So, um, would highly recommend um, whatever 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 your process is, um, spending time to develop that process. Um, and, and really, if you, I mean, even just leaning on, from a consultation perspective, leaning on somebody who's done it before is 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 probably going to be very valuable for you, um, because once you get that process down, the whole thing becomes so much easier to manage. I see um, Janelle's just asked a question about whether Sprout allows us to post multiple photos at once on Instagram, and yes, it does. Um, what, <clears throat> when you have one more, more than one image to go up, so if you've got like a slider um, and you're scheduling it in advance, it will require someone to authenticate it before it goes live, um, but that's just notification you'll get um, through Instagram to go ahead and, and okay that. And there's another question about Loomly. I've never used it. I, so I don't know how to um, say anything. I don't have anything to say about Loomly, I'm sorry. Kind of find what worked for us and then we went running with it. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I think that's an important takeaway too, right? What, um, what works for one may not work for another. Um, so it's important to um, spend the time to, again, this, a lot of this of what we're talking about today is um, spending the, the upfront time um, that'll make the rest of your life so much easier to manage. Um, so spending a little bit of time and exploring Sprout, exploring HubSpot, um, exploring Hootsuite, see what's going to work for you. Um, and then again, when you, once you find the thing that works for me, for, for you from a channel perspective, from a programming perspective, um, when you've, you've keyed in on your audience, when, when you start to feel those things, it'll make such an impact on your day to day. And, and the, all of this will become a little bit more seamless. 
So growing your audience, um, everything that we're talking about today is programming your audience, but you want to grow your audience. You want to take it, all, all of the effort you're putting into your messaging, you're cur curating your content, uh, defining your channels. You want to be able to grow beyond what you are now, of course. Um, but as you've noticed, or you may have noticed over, over the years, um, it's becoming increasingly more challenging to grow your audience through with organic posts. And what I mean by organic posts are just any posts that you put up on any given day. Um, you're only ever going to uh, hit a certain percentage of your followers uh, or people that you're connected to. Um, it's the way that the channels get you to go into ad buys and that we're going to touch on that really um, kind of briefly here. Um, but from a, an organic, there's an organic perspective of, of trying to post a lot with frequency, um, engaging in um, a lot of community management, um, having conversations, um, but still it's going to take a lot of effort to really reach a new audience beyond the core audience that you've developed. Um, Facebook and Instagram in particular want you to use ad buys and, and thankfully it's not overly expensive um, to, to hit a lot of people uh, for a, a fairly um, for a fairly reasonable amount, um, but it still is going to be required if you really want to blow up your audience, um, particularly in, in Facebook, uh, start to see those follower numbers increase. Uh, you're going to have to look at from an from an ad buy perspective um, at some point. Um, so really, what you want to look at here is uh, it's both Instagram and, and Facebook are they're connected, so you're able to get really targeted with your audience. So all of that work that you do up front to establish who it is that you're trying to talk to and what that audience looks like um, is really easy to program through ad buys um, from Facebook and Instagram. Um, again, it's, this is really going to come back to who you want to, who you want to talk to and how you want to talk to them. Um, but certainly uh, the, the, the ability to blow that up quickly um, is done th through ad buys. So um, this isn't, this is something that if, if you really want to go down this um, alleyway, I would really recommend that you have somebody with some experience to do this with you at first. Um, it's, it is pretty, um, uh, it is pretty reasonable in terms of uh, a learning curve, um, but if you've never done it before, you can really just kind of blow through your, your budget without having a real targeted look at um, how that budget's working for you. Um, so again, if um, certainly something you can do yourself, but would highly recommend that at least out of the gate, you get just a, and somebody else's eyes or, or some recommendations around how to, how to set that stuff up. Uh, and then so, and the other aspect that we kind of met, haven't talked a lot about here yet, um, but is email marketing. And um, email marketing has been around as, as long as the internet really, uh, but it's become more refined over time. And the biggest piece uh, to take away from, from email marketing is, is, first of all, you need to create your own data set, uh, which means you need to encourage people to sign up for your email, you need to get uh, permission. And so you're doing that either through um, your social call, call section, or you're doing it through your website, which we'll get to in a minute here. Um, particularly through the website, the one thing that as soon as somebody gives you their information, they're giving you permission to, to contact them. And that is huge, particularly um, um, with the kind of the importance of getting permission online um, to speak to, to a client or a customer. Um, it, it, it's, it's such an important piece these, uh, in, in the current landscape. Um, so the, we use MailChimp as kind of the default. Um, it's the biggest, most common thing on the market. Um, it's super easy to use. It's super intuitive. Um, you're able to, once you collect your data sets, um, and when, when I say data sets, I just mean your, your contact information. Um, when you start to develop different contacts, um, it's very easy to break them up into different segments, um, to have different messages uh, for different people. Um, you can even do A-B testing. Um, so a big thing with, with emails is actually having them opened. And as soon as they, somebody opens an email, the percentage of them taking an action within it, it increases big time. Um, so a lot of what you need to do is play with your open rates and have an understanding of what's the kind of messaging in email title that'll get somebody to jump into the actual email. So um, with something like MailChimp, there's the ability to do A-B testing to see which is working, what's not, um, create data sets, get really targeted in your messaging. Um, and the other thing it does is provide really strong analytics. Um, and with the analytics, uh, um, I just mean um, you can see open rates, you can see click throughs, you can see um, the percentage of people that are interacting with your, with your messages. Um, and it's really simple and easy to use. And you can take that data to inform um, your next decision decision. Um, and we're going to, right at the end of this presentation, we're going to get into the importance of, of analytics and, and informing your decisions, but um, particularly from an email marketing perspective, um, there's lots of that strong data available to help be able to inform those decisions. And so, as we kind of talked about with any of this, um, activation means action. Um, and 
when you're activating anything from your social, from email marketing, um, from any kind of contact that you're, 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 you're putting an effort into, you want to push your audience to somewhere that you can uh, either, if you're not looking just from a sales perspective, you need to capture your audience. So then you can get them into an email list. You can get them into a conversation. Um, you can get them to a point where whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, you can help to elevate that relationship. Um, and so there's a couple different ways of doing this. Um, one, if you're, you're going to put together any kind of campaign that's ad driven or um, you're trying to push people into a conversation, um, developing landing pages is really important. Um, a landing page is really, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of a website or a page of a website that's designed specifically um, to capture your audience that you've identified at the very beginning of this whole process. So when we talk about a linear experience, um, we're starting with the touch point with say if it's a social post and having that be consistent with driving them from the social post through to the website. Um, and having the, the, the messaging and the creative on the website um, have create the same experience as they first had when they had the, the, the first touch point. And so uh, by doing that consistency, you're creating a really smooth experience. You're creating a really strong expectation and a really smooth expectation um, for all of your users that you're kind of driving through this loop of uh, expectation around either sales or conversation. Um, the other side to this is if you're uh, not going to take them out of social and onto a, a website, it's having really strong uh, calls to action. So what do you want them to do? What do you want your audience to do? If it's to make a sale, your, your shop now, you need to have a shop button. Um, if it's to create a conversation, we have to have a contact now button. Um, so really that, and that pre-planning is in play here um, because you've already identified identified really at the, the start of all this, what it is that you, your end goal is. And um, that needs to permeate all the way through from your posts, all the way to the landing spots, um, as you can kind of see some examples here. Um, and then again, I kind of just I touched on this, but if, um, really if you're gonna take them offline or keep them on social, just having that plan in place um, as to how you're going to do that. Um, and again, that, that, that really focuses around really strong calls to action. Uh, and then we get into the website. And so with, um, with any kind of digital landscape, um, the ideal recommendation for us is that your website is your hub. Um, you use your touch points from social, um, from, your, from, from Google, whatever it is that you're going to activate. Um, and you want to push your you want to push your users somewhere to something that you own, um, ideally. Um, and then they can really become immersed with your brand and with your business and your, with your product and what you're trying to sell. And that's from a web level. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, there's all kinds of different options for creating this um, from one pagers all the way down to the most complex. Um, there's lots of DIY options for this. Um, there's lots of different ways to go about uh, putting something online, but in, in the end, it's really important that you have a presence for yourself. Um, and there's lots of things to consider with it as well. And so this again, with, like with anything here, it comes back to the pre-planning that we've done. And so from the website level, um, what is it that you're trying to accomplish throughout all of this? Are you trying to, are you putting uh, products and services front and center? And if you are, um, make sure that they are front and center on your site. So when they come off from a, a social post or, or whatever it is that's driving them there, there's consistency and they're getting to where they need to get to very quickly. Um, Products and services, like I said, if you've got the imagery, uh, make it consistent with the stuff that you're putting up on, on social as well. Um, do you need to consider delivery? Do you need to consider shipping and communications and store management? There's all kinds of stuff that goes into a consideration here. Um, but again, this comes back to, the, to, to setting yourself up from the beginning and, and, and knowing what you want to accomplish at the end. If, um, if you know that you're, you're selling a product, well, you need to consider all of the things about how you're getting them the product. What does the shipping cost come into play? You need to talk about those kind of things through your social posts as well to set those expectations for when they get to the website. Um, so lots of things to consider from, from a web level. And then there's all kinds of platform options as well. Um, at Clearvision, we have a couple of go-tos through Shopify and WooCommerce, particularly from a sales perspective. Um, both of them have, have their benefits, um, but just like anything that we've kind of touched on here, it's really important that you do um, the work or have conversations with people who have this knowledge already um, to understand what's really gonna work for you and what's gonna work with the whole program that you're trying to put together. And then the big piece, um, 
the biggest the most the biggest benefit to having this kind of digital landscape and this digital ecosystem that we've talked about is your ability to measure whether it's working or not so every single piece that we've touched on today um, from all of the various social channels um, to to MailChimp with email marketing um, down to the website level, um, you have the ability to look at different analytics that tell you if you're, what you're doing is working. And so there's all kinds of ways um, to go about uh, identifying that. Um, so some of the things to consider is look at your views. Um, are the posts that you're getting up getting engagement? Um, what kind of engagement are they getting? Um, are you are you are you getting people commenting? Are you getting people talking uh, through your in, within your posts? Um, are you able to drive um, people from social to your website? And you can look through your website analytics to see how people are getting to your site and the action that they're taking on there. Um, if you're talking about email marketing, are we getting any open rates? Are people looking at the emails that you're sending out? And if not, um, you can you can really dive down and have an understanding of of where it is that you're falling down on this. Um, are you getting click throughs to links from the emails you're sending out? And then the, the big one of all, of course, is if you're, if you're having a sales campaign, are you making sales? Um, but the, the benefit here is that you can take a look at all of these pieces individually um, and really do an assessment um, and measure whether all of those pieces are working together or not. Because that's the, the other thing about creating this linear experience is that all of these different pieces that we've talked about today have to work together. Um, but you can, the, the benefit is, is that with, with the amount of analytics and, and the numbers that you have access to through these things, you can tell if something's not working or not. And so, like I said, lots of tracking tools available. Um, every, through through your website, Google Analytics is pretty standard. Um, if you're using Shopify, there's analytics right within it. Um, same for programs like Mailchimp, uh, your Facebook Ads Manager. They'll all have those kind of like really juicy numbers that you can get locked into and have an understanding if if it's working or not. Um, now, this isn't common knowledge by any means um, to understand how some of these numbers work. Um, we'll take some education, and again, if if you don't have that time, um, leaning on somebody who knows these things to kind of give you a quick tutorial um, is really going to be a benefit for you. And that brings us to the end of our conversation today. Um, so if there's any comments or, or Allison, if you have anything that you want to kind of throw in there before we. Yeah, yeah. One, one cool thing we're talking about tracking is if you use um, a scheduling, a social scheduler like Sprout or Hootsuite, HubSpot, you can download um, you know, documents, PDFs or CSVs um, of all your social channels at any point you can customize the time um you know at the end of every month we kind of like to produce our so like where we're at with our with the conversions or whatnot um and it's really easy to just download it all off of straight from sprout so it's kind of neat i'm not logging into each platform to try and get that information so there were a few questions from uh, the group. Jackie asked, uh, would you recommend a contest to draw people in through an ad buy? Yeah, that's a uh, good question. So with, um, okay, so uh, one of the complications around contesting is that the um, Facebook and Instagram um, change their kind of what's allowed all the time. So you have to be very careful about staying on top of that. It also depends on what you're trying to put a contest against. Um, so like, say if you're trying to uh, promote, say something like uh, alcohol or cannabis, it can be very challenging as well. Um, but in general, contesting is a really good way to encourage the kind of organic push. And so uh, one thing, one thing I've seen uh, that's very popular is, you know, uh, like, share, and then comment. Uh, and so you're kind of getting all of those actions together. And from an organic perspective, it really starts to create momentum for you. Um, so the short answer is yes, that's, that's contesting is a good idea to try to, uh, to elevate um, all of those kind of numbers that you're, that you're looking for inflation on. Perfect. Uh, question from Rudy. Is MailChimp and Constant Contact basically the same thing? Uh, yeah, they're just two different options, for sure. Um, Constant Contact is something that I stopped using uh, quite a few years, years ago because I felt like it fell behind in terms of um, the, the functionality and the ease of use. Um, but sure, they're, they're very similar in terms of their output. Yeah, We use Constant Contact and it has changed again uh, probably three or four months ago it changed everything and it, it's, um, it, it looks a lot better now. You find it easier to use? It's a lot easier to use. There's more like uh, drag and clicks and uh, formatting is a lot easier because I know for a while it was, it was ridiculous, but it's, uh, yeah, it looks a lot modern now, which is nice. Oh, right 
it's yeah. good to know. I I kind of written it off to be honest. So yeah, I have any- yeah. Sure. Uh, so Tracy, uh, this is one of my questions as well. Tracy asks, how often should you post? Is it should it be daily? Uh, Allison, do you want to handle that one? Sure. Um, it, it also depends on what platforms you're going to use. If you think of Instagram, people scroll and there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, so on Instagram, yeah, you want to do daily. Something like LinkedIn. Um, again, you're thinking about what your audience is when you're on LinkedIn. Uh, it's going to be more formal. I guess that's a good way to describe it. We tend to try to get our clients to post a minimum of three to four times a week. Um, aiming for daily for the most part. Yeah, and the other thing I would add to that is um, whatever it is that you are able to, to, and it needs to be reasonable for yourself too. I think that like what, like what Allison said, the goal is going to be daily for sure. Um, if that's not reasonable for you, whatever is reasonable, say if it's just three times a week, be consistent and make sure you stick with it. It's better to say post three or four times a week and be consistent about it um, than to post seven times one week and then once the next week. Would you agree with that, Allie? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right so I have a, a couple questions of my own then. Actually, you answered quite a few of my questions. I was kept making little notes and then you would answer them, which is great. Um, so you mentioned uh, in the beginning about uh, knowing your audience and uh, timing of posts and so forth like that. So is there um, a way to, to know this? So if I, my audience is businesses, um, is there a way for me to know kind of which is the best time to post for, for businesses? Like, yeah, sure. That's a great question, Tanya. It's something we maybe didn't touch on quite enough. Um, is this is all an experiment, just like anything with marketing. It's an experiment first. Um, the good thing about digital is it's a quick experiment. Um, and so part of the, part of an expectation you should set for yourself is that when you're starting to engage in this kind of program, um, the first little while that you're doing this is really about collecting data and having an understanding of, say, if you put out two weeks worth of posts, looking at that data and you can get an understanding of what time of the day are people engaging with your posts? Um, who, what, what are the demographics that are engaging with your posts? And so if you're going through that audience profiling and maybe you don't have a hundred percent understanding of it and you're having a tough time getting there, if you start posting, you can start to draw some of the data out of those posts and it'll help inform your decisions going forward. And so maybe you don't know what that answer is right out of the gate, but you can find out awfully quick um, based on the analytics that come back from the posts that you put up. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's, and that's great. Sorry. And think about also if it's a product that you're trying to sell. If you're trying to sell pizza, don't put a promotion on at eight in the morning. Yeah. Lunchtime, mid to late afternoon and evening. Okay, perfect. Um, when we were talking about LinkedIn earlier, um, my, my issue with LinkedIn is I, I don't understand if there's an algorithm to it or what, but every time I go on LinkedIn, I feel like I'm seeing something from two months ago to two hours ago to three weeks ago, like there's no chronological order to it. Is it something, um, you know, that I'm doing? <laughs> no, that's not, and it's not just LinkedIn anymore either, Tanya. And Facebook's like that too. I thought, yeah. Like, it can be, and it's changing a lot too. The algorithms, uh, the way they're set up change a lot. Um, and that's, that's where the frustration comes around with trying to hit your audience consistently from an organic perspective. It can be very challenging yeah. um, because you're not able to dictate to that uh, really. Um, so that's when you have to, when you're, especially from when you're trying to grow your audience, um, that's where the ad buy situation comes into play big time because you can get way more targeted and you can, you can program when you want your dads to show and when you want your posts to show, as opposed to when you're doing it organically, you're kind of at the, the platform's uh, mercy. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that is all on my side. I don't know if anybody else has any, um, quick questions for Allison or Aaron. Um, Thank you so much. That's great that you've got that information right there. I will be uh, probably sending out an email over the next uh, couple of days to everybody that attended. And I will again have Aaron and Allison's um, uh, contact information for you. So if you want to kind of go on a little bit further with them, I know I've had uh, 
quite a few com uh, conversations with Aaron and Patrick. This is my first time talking to Allison, but uh, they're very helpful and uh, they're always willing to have a conversation and a coffee with you. So if you have more questions, uh, don't hesitate to uh, give them a holler. Um, thank you so much, everybody, again, for, for joining us today. It was very nice uh, on this rainy day to uh, have a virtual Zoom instead of having to get up early and, and going out in this weather. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Tomorrow is our last event for Small Business Week, and it is with uh, Patrice from BACD on Business Model Canvas. Um, a great one for new businesses, old businesses, uh, if you're just kind of want to uh, reevaluate what your what your business model is, that'd be great. Uh, and we've got a lot of great uh, events coming up in the next two months. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, hopefully we see you. I always do my air quotes when I say see you uh, <laughs> again soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.